Good morning, good afternoon, uh, or good evening, everyone. Uh, and thank you for being here, well, whatever here means for you in this context. Um, I'm Daniele Salerno, and with uh, Marit van der Varenburg, we welcome you to this masterclass. Uh, thank you for choosing it, and thank you for uh, spending with us this uh, one hour and a half that we hope will be productive for everyone. Uh, we are obviously uh, honored and pleased to, to contribute to this uh, uh, MSA conference with this masterclass that uh, actually is uh, a, a 2.0 masterclass because uh, this masterclass took place uh, uh, in a 1.0 version in Madrid in 2019. Uh, and actually uh, it already produced uh, uh, a, a publication on the on the journal semiotic a few months ago where I re-elaborated and summarized the content of that masterclass. Um, and I was uh, asked to replicate that uh, that experience. I was glad to do that. Uh, and obviously uh, adapting this that masterclass to this new context and uh, um, reaching that masterclass with uh, the uh, last two years of, uh, of, of research uh, at, uh, uh, as a Marie Curie Fellow at the University of Utrecht uh, with the project uh, Memorites, Cultural Memory in LGBT Activism in collaboration with the University of Buenos Aires where I am now. And uh, uh, as a collaborator in the um, in the project uh, um, Remembering Activism, REACT, which is an ERC project and uh, you funded project led by Professor Anne Rigny uh, at the uh, University of Utrecht. And in this, uh, uh, within this context, uh, I was lucky because I, I met uh, and uh, I started, I, I worked with Marit on these uh, um, on this uh, on our methodological case study, Bella Ciao. I have to say that uh, with Mari yesterday, by chance, we got the first shot of uh, of vaccine. So both we are. I was feverish, <laughs> and uh, also Mari had some some symptoms. So we are not one hundred percent, but uh, I hope we we will do that. Um. Uh, so let's start. Uh, uh, I'm, I shared uh, the PowerPoint. Now, now okay. I can see it. Okay, sorry. Um, so um, what? Uh, uh, well, I I, I start. Uh, uh, let's say from our point of arrival, just to give you. Uh, the perspective uh, of what we are doing for, for well, representing this, for giving you, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, this perspective, I elaborated this sort of uh, um, cover for the masterclass. So you have here the uh, NLP uh, from the 1960s, where uh, one of the first, uh, uh, canonical recording of Bella Ciao, and you have three pictures, uh, Italy in 1945, uh, which is um, actually the, the original context of the song, um, a song that was used by partisans during the resistance, so in the uh, war uh, for the liberation of Italy from Nazi fascism. Here you can see, uh, um, a Chilean demonstrator uh, in the context of the recent revolt in, 20, uh, in 2019, uh, up to now, uh, dressed like uh, um, uh, La Casa de Papel character, Monehist character that, uh, as we will see, is behind the revival of the song uh, um, uh, recently. And here you can see the uh, demonstrations of uh, um, in Buenos Aires in February 2020 for the legalization of abortion. 
So here you see uh, three uh, different contexts in which uh, uh, the song was used. And our uh, very empirical, very, um, let's say, practical uh, issue was how to trace and track uh, these, uh, um, the traveling of this song uh, through different contexts, through different historical period, uh, through different media, and uh, uh, across different cultures and from a language to another. Uh, so the, uh, the issue was uh, how to uh, um, analyze these, uh, uh, these traveling uh, across different uh, uh, contexts, uh, media, languages, culture, etc. So actually the, the masterclass is not only uh, on working transmedially, but working also uh, across different uh, uh, languages and uh, uh, different causes, because these are uh, different social movements, uh, etc. Um, so uh, the uh, what we will do is in the first part we will identify the methodological gap. The uh, um, uh, well, the, 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 some maybe some of the limits in memory studies that, uh, um, uh, let's say, um, limit our uh, possibilities uh, uh, for uh, doing this type of analysis. Uh, I will uh, um, describe very briefly the two models that, uh, uh, well, I identified uh, within memory studies uh, that I called uh, containment and flow model. And we will see a, a, a semiotic perspective for addressing uh, these uh, methodological gaps uh, in memory studies. Obviously, we will we'll not um, well solve uh, epistemological or methodological problems in uh, one hour and a half, but uh, just we will work on uh, a few tools for, uh, uh, for doing this type of uh, analysis. And we'll, we will have a short discussion, a five minute break to avoid <clears throat> the, uh, well, the Zoom fatigue. And uh, we will have uh, in the second part, Mari, we will, uh, will introduce the second part uh, with uh, um, uh, the relationship between song and social movements, and we will uh, analyze our uh, our case study, and we will close with uh, uh, another uh, moment of discussion. So uh, <clears throat> let's uh, uh, well identify the gap. Uh, and I start with uh, a quotation from uh, uh, Andrew Hoskins' introduction to uh, digital memory studies, in which Andrew Hoskins says, uh, media is the multitude of techniques, technologies, and practices through which discourse interaction is mediated. This is the entire semiotic environment in which memory is understood and made relevant to a person, given community, or group. <clears throat> in this uh, uh, quotation, Hoskins, uh, well, identify three elements, uh, media, memory, and uh, uh, <clears throat> person given community or group. Uh, what, uh, what's the problem here for, uh, uh, for Hoskins? The problem here is that uh, as social agents, as social actors, we always understand uh, uh, memory, memory for us, mm, let's say emerges from the articulation of different uh, uh, media of different, uh, let's say, semiotic substances, images, writing, etc. Et uh, but as uh, uh, researchers uh, in the humanities or social science, um, we, uh, we, we tend to isolate in our laboratory cultural objects uh, trying to uh, see in these uh, uh, cultural objects with uh, 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 medium specific or uh, discourse specific uh, methods uh, to un well to see how this cultural object let's say contain memory how they 
uh, enact memory. But actually, as I said, as social actors, we always understand memory actually in the articulation of different media. Um, let's, let's take an example. For me, the memory of the Holocaust uh, is, uh, emerges uh, from the articulation of, for example, uh, Primo Levi's books, uh, uh, Benini's movie, uh, Schindler's List, uh, uh, Holocaust, the TV series, uh, uh, or Nuit Brouillard, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it does not emerge just for, uh, from Primo Levi's book, but in the articulation of these different media. Uh, what Toskins argues is uh, that uh, <clears throat> we need a new ontology for memory studies because uh, uh, he argues that we live in an hyperconnected world uh, in which we need to articulate this semiotic environment. We need methodologies that are uh, capable of uh, uh, tracing and tracking memory in, uh, across uh, different uh, media, different semiotic substances, different, pra different practices, etc. Actually, what I argue is that the problem is mainly um, methodological in the sense that in memory studies, um, we have, uh, um, let's say, a disciplinary division of the methodological labor. So uh, memory studies is uh, a field of interest where a different disciplines converge. Um, uh, for example, uh, literary studies or visual studies, uh, and each researcher is trained uh, uh, with uh, specific methodologies uh, for the analysis of specific uh, cultural objects. The problem is uh, how to, um, uh, well, to, to address uh, uh, this gap that generates uh, a mismatch between uh, the way we understand memory socially and we analyze as a research uh, uh, memory. So the issue is uh, how we articulate the semiotic env environment in which uh, uh, memory uh, emerges. So how we articulate this multitude of techniques, technologies, and practices to which discourse interactions is mediated. And how we articulate the semiotic environment with the social environment. So with um, individual memories, a person or a uh, let's say collective memory. And actually here there is also an opposition with, um, between cultural memory and collective memory, which uh, is also um, one of the points in the uh, opposition between uh, the containment model and the flow model. Uh, for containment model, uh, uh, in, I uh, well identified in particular for example, two concepts, cadre uh, socio de la memoire, frameworks of memory by Maurice Olbox, and lieu de memoire, or sites of memory by Pierre Nora. Uh, and these two concepts, in these two concepts, we see uh, how um, uh, the object of analysis is uh, uh, isolated uh, very uh, rigorously uh, um, delimited. Um, uh, and uh, uh, let's, uh, let's take uh, um, the way Pierre Nora uh, does this uh, in the introduction to the, um, to the English uh, edition of Lier de Memoir. Uh, he says, uh, the point of departure was to study national feeling not in the traditional thematic or chronological manner, but instead by analyzing the places in which the collective heritage of France was crystallized, the specific role that memory played in the construction of the French idea of the nation. The central, the central point, the goal is to reinterpret the history of France in symbolic terms, a history that is interested in memory, not as remembrance, but as the overall structure of the past within the present. So, uh, in this uh, uh, definition uh, by Pierre Nora, uh, we see uh, some of the elements of this uh, uh, methodological approach. First of all, 
a, a, a synchronic approach, Nora is interested in the overall structure of the past. Um, uh, and uh, um, the study of memory for studying identity. So memory in this methodological approach in memory studies is uh, um, an epiphenomenon of identity is uh, uh, we study memory in order to, to study identity making, uh, basically, in the case of Pierre Noirat, uh, French identity. The second model uh, is uh, uh, what I call the flow model. Uh, and we have here a sort of German tradition, the idea of uh, uh, Abi Warburg uh, afterlife, the idea of uh, Nemo history by Jan Asman. And uh, uh, let's see how Jan Asman, for example, um, uh, defines uh, these uh, these methods and uh, that I see how uh, ha, um, as uh, um, as example of a flow uh, uh, approach, uh, let's say uh, memory as uh, movement. A memo history um, surveys the storylines of tradition, the webs of intertextuality, the diachronic continuities and discontinuities. Um, of reading the past. It deliberately leaves aside the synchronic aspects of what it is investigating. It concentrates exclusively on those aspects of significance and relevance, uh, uh, which are the product of memory that is of recourse to a past and which appear only in the light of later readings. Uh, and uh, Yasman says, uh, we construct concatenation of texts which are based on each other and treat or negotiate the common subject matter, a kind of textual conversation or debate which might extend over generations and century, even millennia. Uh, what uh, in this uh, definition we see uh, other characteristics. First of all, a diachronic approach, uh, a, a, a diachronic approach. Uh, second, uh, um, the concatenation of text. So uh, while Nora's project is about uh, uh, also uh, um, looking at the, uh, the contents of its uh, uh, monumental collection, every, uh, every chapter is uh, more or less de uh, devoted to one object. In the case of Arburg, the, the issue is to um, to define a concatenation of texts. Uh, and in the case of uh, Var, uh, the, of uh, Asman, uh, the issue is uh, um, uh, to study memory as uh, uh, culture. So while um, in the case of Nora, the relationship is between memory and identity, in the case of Jan Asman is between um, memory and culture. A uh, one uh, important uh, bibliographic reference for uh, uh, also for uh, these for studying these uh, um, uh, these uh, different methodologies, these different approaches, in memory studies is this article by Astrid Dern, "Traveling Memory," uh, published in two thousand eleven. Uh, so uh, just to summarize, uh, we have two uh, approaches, uh, memory, uh, the containment approach uh, in which there is, uh, we focus on the relationship between memory and identity. We have uh, uh, one medium, one genre, one genre analysis and uh, a synchronic approach. While in the flow model, uh, we have the rela a relationship between memory and culture, the analysis of transformation through time, through uh, a, the construction of a corpus as concatenation of texts, and uh, a, a diachronic approach. And it's what uh, in semiotics uh, is uh, uh, the relationship between form and movement. So, in the case of the containment model, uh, we are more uh, we focus more on the form of the uh, of the cultural object we analyze. Why, in the case of, uh, for example, of Jan, of Jan Asman, 
uh, model, we are more interested in, in how um, uh, memory moves uh, across time. The, uh, let's say the theoretical, um, more general um, aim of, uh, uh, of, of this masterclass in general of uh, uh, what we do is to uh, combine these. So not uh, uh, or containment or flow or form or movement, but to see form and movement together, to analyze uh, in, in our case, the form of Bella Ciao as a song in its movement, in its traveling across different uh, contexts. Uh, so here, uh, uh, enters uh, semiotics and semiotics of culture for, uh, um, well, for addressing these, uh, these gaps, for uh, trying to connect these uh, uh, different approaches uh, in memory studies. And uh, I start with uh, um, Yuri Lotman. Yuri Lotman is a Russian semiotician actually, um, he is well known in uh, uh, cultural memory studies because he was one of the sources of inspiration for uh, uh, Jan and Aleida Asman. Uh, and for, uh, um, for uh, Yuri Lotman, um, the, the semiotic study of culture is the study of the functional correlation of different science systems. So for Lotman, the issue is. Uh, um, he says we, 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 we need to articulate, for example, uh, literature, uh, uh, political systems, different discursive domains in order to study culture and uh, meaning making, which is uh, uh, mm, the, uh, he, he defines these uh, semiospheres. So, uh, how different uh, uh, discursive domains, different media, et cetera, are correlated together uh, and how they make sense together. And the second source is uh, uh, Umberto Eco uh, that uh, um, uh, define uh, the semiotic study of culture as the study of, of, of uh, a system of interlocking semiotic systems. That uh, means more or less uh, the same. Uh, Lotman and Deco, um, well, work in the, in the same, uh, uh, we can say in the same perspective, which means uh, to, to be able to, uh, to see, um, to, to study uh, meaning making, uh, not, uh, isolating uh, specific uh, uh, objects, but uh, uh, seeing uh, uh, them in the articulations of different discursive domain, um, domains, media, and of, uh, as uh, Echo said, different semiotic systems. That is actually what, uh, um, uh, going back to, uh, <clears throat> to uh, to Hoskins uh, is actually what we need uh, when we need to articulate the entire semiotic environment in which memory is understood. So to be able to articulate uh, different media in the <clears throat> in memory making. Um, so uh, what? The methodological implication of this uh, um, of this theoretical uh, perspective. Echo says, in order to do that, we need to identify models as common ground of comparison that are transposable from one phenomenon to another, uh, regardless of the medium, genre, specific substance that is used. <clears throat> So we need to uh, have a, a model that uh, is, uh, uh, plays the role of uh, um, allowing, us, allowing us to compare uh, different uh, phenomena uh, on, well, on a common ground. And one of the uh, first, uh, um, maybe the original source of this approach 
uh, although it's uh, a little bit uh, uh, old fashioned, maybe now, is this, uh, uh, this uh, study by uh, Vladimir Prop, uh, is a, a 1928 uh, book uh, on the uh, folk tale. Um, in which, uh, uh, and we, what uh, uh, I, I, I will show you now is uh, what Prop uh, did methodologically. Uh, and we will see that it's, it is something, it, it is a model that is still uh, uh, valid today, is still used today. He collected uh, a corpus of 100 folk tales. He, uh, he tried to uh, identify common structural patterns that were uh, narrative functions, sequences of actions, and uh, the identification of characters, actants, what uh, we, we call uh, now in narratology, but are also, for example, in action, uh, action network theory, actants. Um, uh, what uh, what he, he did he, uh, he he built a a, 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 a common uh, structural pattern he, he, he abstracted he, in, and extracted for uh, from folk tales a form which is differently implemented and realized in the different uh, 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 folk tales uh, that uh, were part uh, of uh, uh, his corpus. Um, so uh, in this way, being able to see the uh, continuities uh, across these different folk tales and the discontinuities, so the uh, variance uh, of, uh, uh, within this corpus. This, uh, this is a way uh, of, uh, um, of analyzing uh, cultural objects that uh, uh, since then produce different models. Uh, the first uh, is maybe Algirdas Julien Gremas uh, model of narrativity, the actantial model, etc. And uh, this model uh, was, uh, let's say, imported in Italy. Uh, uh, this is a book by Paolo Fabri on the semiotic tan. And uh, through, uh, let's say, this genealogy, uh, this model arrived to Bruno Latour's uh, action network theory. So it is uh, a methodological approach that uh, uh, continues to produce uh, uh, methodological models. Um, uh, and this is uh, uh, important uh, because although um, a prop uh, obviously applied uh, his model to uh, a, a, a specific genre and a specific medium folk tales, that are uh, folk tales obviously, uh, gradually through these different uh, re-elaboration of this methodological approach, uh, um, Actually, this model was extended to different media. In the case of Bremas, the actantial model is uh, uh, applied regardless of the major uh, genre and semiotic uh, substance that is used. So it is a general, uh, a general model that can be applied to different media. So, Let's see how we, and I close here the first part, let's, uh, let's see how we, um, um, we do this with Bella Ciao. Uh, we uh, collected uh, different versions of Bella Ciao. We, uh, we uh, uh, elaborated a, a, a common uh, model and we uh, analyzed how this model was differently realized through a recontextualizations of the song and of this model through different uh, social movement and uh, also including a TV series uh, as 
eh, la uh, Casa de Papel. Eh, we will see how Bella Ciao in this case uh, becomes what Lucio Spaziante calls a portable song and what uh, uh, with Dan Rigney we define as a portable monument for activism. So uh, a song that is uh, uh, differently uh, recontextualized as a, a, as a form, a structural form, and uh, is adapted to the different context in which is used. So we need, we need again to, um, to study and to identify a form, a structural form, for analyzing the traveling of this song across different contexts, uh, languages, and uh, uh, movements and causes. Uh, so uh, this is uh, um, the first part uh, of the of the master class. We can have uh, a already a discussion, a, a 10 minutes discussion, and we will have a break and uh, Marit will start the second part of the, uh, of the, of the masterclass. Uh, so if, if you want uh, to, to start a, a, dis a discussion uh, on, this, uh, on this part, If you if you have uh, comments or uh, questions, uh... can you see um, what I'm sharing now? Okay, great. Um... Uh, so, um, great to be here, uh, first off. Um, so, I'm going to tell you a little bit of how we uh, encountered our topic and also the challenges of, of, of working with um, music. And then I'll be uh, specific, uh, specifically focusing on the uh, particularities of the music for our case study. So, how we sort of work with the fact that we're dealing with this medium and how you work with music and how you also take into consideration that you're working with something that actually has sound. Um, so, um, we, um, well, we were of course working with a protest song, so it was interesting to see how, um, songs and musical performance play a role in activism. And this idea of memory actually plays a role there, um, particularly, um, Jemson and Ironman, uh, sociologists are working in the field of social movement studies, have been interested in the ways in which uh, music can sort of function as a, as a ritual or as a tradition that carries a long memory and that also has the capacity of, of bridging uh, the gap between certain movements and also how music can mobilize people um, and maybe inspire new waves of mobilization um, and very much um, how it functions as sort of a source um, of collective identity. Um, but we also saw there very much uh, in their approach of music that it's so much focused on on these actors and how they use um, that that form, but not so much on uh, on that form. So exactly what is this musical uh, product and how um, does it function? How is it adapted? What happens in those adaptations? What do you need to study or what is interesting about the, the artifact in itself? Um, so um, Martinelli, uh, Dario Martinelli, who's a musicologist, um, proved helpful in actually understanding how that form uh, functions in movement, how it interacts um, with different things. And he argues that in order to study protest songs, you actually need to look at uh, three uh, aspects, three factors that are um, sort of together work in an organic process, so to say. And those uh, factors are the music, um, the lyrics, and the context. And these are equally important um, and you shouldn't disregard one or the other. Um, so I think that's also what we try to do, Daniel, in our analysis is that we looked at these elements. Um, so um, before um, moving on to uh, the music, I'll briefly uh, talk a little bit more about our case study and introduce our corpus there a little bit. Um, so um, let me see. 
Yes. So Daniela, you already briefly talked a little bit about um, Bella Ciao as it being a partisan song um, and how it was sort of, um, <clears throat> how it interacted with this context. Um, so I'll just keep it brief here, but we were of course interested in tracing how the song moved um, from one context to another. And there are various hypotheses as to where it originated. Um, and it turns out that the song is very much an assemblage of various other songs um, and that it saw the popularization through media events. So first, uh, what Dan Daniela briefly pointed out that it was canonized in the 1960s, also through this first record, um, which made it popular and sort of brought it back up as a sort of a quintessential um, partisan song. And then also in 2017, when it was incorporated in the popular series La Casa de Papel. And that particular popularization, popularization also informed our corpus in that we were very much interested in seeing how um, that media event intensified for uses of Bella Ciao. Um, so we um, worked with the um, database of the Remembering Activism Project there to uh, collect um, Various versions of uh, various versions of Bella Ciao reuses, uh, leading to quite an extensive list. I think at the end we had about forty to fifty um, reuses of Bella Ciao, and as you can already see in this list, um, the locations in which they are used are quite uh, diverse, as are the uh, causes for which uh, the song is used, um, and the database actually allows us to um, visualize that in multiple ways. Um, so we have uh, here two visualizations, uh, one is on linguistic one and the other is geographical. Um, and there you can also see already how the lyrics invite um, certain processes or adaptations. So on the left hand side, you can see the linguistic um, visualization where you can see that in the middle there's this very big dot for Italian then on the left there's English and on the right there's the Spanish and the fact that these are also connected points at the way that the Bella Ciao motif which is in the middle of the song is very often still incorporated in for instance the Spanish version of the song so that it's still connected and uses that um, particular origin in those original lyrics. Uh, for the geographical visualization here I also have a more uh, detailed map. I hope you can read uh, the text that is on it too. But this map um, showcases where our uh, reuses or the versions that we found in tracing uh, uh, Bella Ciao uh, actually happened. And um, well, it's quite broad, of course. We this is all manual work, so this are all these are all versions that we found ourselves on the internet, and not just it's not. Um, a direct uh, display of what is out there because we weren't able to do that, uh, unfortunately, but maybe it might have been too much as well, but uh, it's what we found and you can see that it's quite diverse and also um, in the reuses that many of them are actually after 2017 and that that increased after that time. Um, so that you can see that apparently that popularization of the song in a Netflix series is quite influential. Um, so I will now uh, go into the form a little bit and how the music functions in movement also. Um, and for this, what we did for our project was to uh, sort of sound the music. So to close read the original music, but then also see how that original music was adapted in new context and moved. Um, so I will uh, talk a little bit about the original song if we can speak of course of one original in this case, and then also talk about three, um, other versions. And I think Daniela, you sent around a list with uh, various versions of Bella Ciao. Some of you might have looked at those um, already. And I'll just highlight three of them uh, to give you a sense of how this song uh, moves and is musically adapted. Um, so the first thing, thing that's very um, specific for Bella Ciao and something that actually happens quite a lot um, in um, protest songs is that it uses a very distinctive rhythm a march rhythm, which is very accessible for participants. So um, a march rhythm, um, well, you're probably familiar with it. It's very distinct, it's very, it's very straight pattern. Um, and historically march rhythms were used for people to walk in close ranks. So actually for soldiers to feel that sense of uh, walking together, the, the, the normal rhythm or the average uh, pace of a march rhythm is 120 beats per minute, which is um, the multiplication of the average heartbeat. So that it sort of works as if you're in a trance, um, you can really feel that rhythm in your 
body and it can add to a sort of a sense of, of collective experience, so to say. Um, so arguably that very accessible rhythmical structure invites these processes, invites these movements, um, also for the untrained singer or performer. Um, then also another aspect that uh, came to the fore upon analyzing this uh, uh, song is that the um, song is set in the key in a harmonic minor key, which basically means that it mostly uses minor chords, which we commonly associate with um, more sad uh, feelings or not as uplifting as our major chords. And harmonic minor is mostly in uh, set in minor, with the exception of one chord, and that's the major chord, which sort of gives a hopeful air to that song, so to say. And what's interesting is that the music then musically actually illustrate what the storyline or the narrative of the story, which Daniela will tell more about later on, she talks about. So it's the story of a partisan who, who dies, which is then a minor, like which is the sad part uh, indicated by the minor. But then also there is this hopeful touch by the fact that his death is not for nothing because he, he fought for the freedom of the country, the people. And that is musically illustrated by the use of that particular chord uh, progression and those key, uh, the key in which the song is set. Um, so that's for the basic form, so to say. But then what happens when this song moves around and travels from country to country or from cause to cause? Well, um, one of the versions that we uh, stumbled upon is, um, let me see, I don't know if I can share sound. Uh, might be nice to listen to a short part, I think, but I can just um, see if I can uh, play it and if you, whether you can hear it, just let me know. Can you hear anything or not? No sound? Hmm. Um, let me see. Well, I'm not sure how I can do that, but I can also just describe it if that's <laughs> okay. But uh, for the first version, which you just saw, um, I can also send the link so that you can listen to it later on. Um, but what's striking about this particular version, uh, it's a version from Chile uh, from 2019, I believe. And in this version, there is a marching band playing the song. Uh, there's no singing per se, but there's this, also this dance choreography. And the, this very straight march rhythm is here and uh, makes use of a very distinctive syncopation. And syncopation uh, means sort of that the, the very regular meter is, um, is sort of omitted, giving it a, a forward moving drive. So it's a, it's, it's a different um, emphasis. So the, the regular rhythmic accent is displaced. And this is very distinctive for the, the South American musical tradition. So you can see how then the music is adopted in such a way that it fits that particular cultural context. Um, now the second version, I'm very um, sorry to say that this version as one of the um, participants of the uh, uh, of this uh, masterclass pointed out to us, is not available anymore. Unfortunately, it was made private. Um, but it is a very interesting uh, version too. It is um, a video where uh, Spanish uh, Roma uh, sing Bella Ciao at the um, Italian embassy in Spain, following the decision of the Italian uh, interior minister Salvini to um, deport Roma from Italy. And these Roma in Spain uh, decide to protest this and they do so by singing Bella Ciao at the embassy, but they do so through um, a rhythmic structure uh, that is a flamenco structure. So they dance flamenco and they clap a flamenco pattern while performing this song in Italian. Uh, and as such, they bring together actually two things. On the one hand, they talk about, well, they, they sing it in Italian, but then on the other hand, they also incorporate rhythms that are particular for their culture. So they musically um, illustrate actually what they're protesting for, namely the acceptance of, of that Roma culture in Italy by bringing together the Italian language with the rhythm. Um, so I'm actually very sad that this particular video is not available anymore because I, thought, I think it's a very great example of it. But that's unfortunate, I suppose. And then there's this final version, which is slightly different, but which I want to point out to you anyway. And that is um, a version, a Belgian version, but it's in English. Um, called Sing for the Climate. And in this version, um, I can actually show it to you even though you cannot hear it. Um, you have um, children singing Bella Ciao. And it's interesting to, to me that they 
particularly decided for children to be singing this song. The children sing, do it now, do it now, uh, instead of Bella Chow saying sort of like, okay, we need to wake up, we need to rise up, we need to open our eyes and do it now. And they point at the urgency of that, of, of climate or of fighting climate change, of stopping climate change, of, of bringing our attention to this problem. Um, and it's it's very um, relevant, actually. This is a project that was not started by children, but by um, an Ital or a Belgian uh, television uh, producer. But they opted for children to sing this, and and as such, with the, the children's voices, they point at the urgency of this problem as being also a generational problem. So maybe having children sing that song illustrates for people that. Even if you're yourself not very interested in climate change as such or wanting to protest this, then still the children point out that it's for them, that it's, it's important for them and their generation that we stop this now, we do it now because it's their future. And so this sort of also shows how the music can bring a sort of temporal dimension to the issue. Um, so I hope these three examples sort of give you a sense of how the song travels and also uh, develops. And I'll put the links to the songs in the chat so that you can open them yourselves. Um, but yeah, this is a part also a part of our project to see like how does the music change uh, as the song travels. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Uh, Daniela, I can give the floor to you. Uh, I think now I'll stop sharing my screen. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much for uh, for uh, uh, this analysis. Uh, uh, I I will uh, um, while Marit uh, focused on the uh, music uh, of Bella Ciao, as I'm totally ignorant uh, uh, on music. Uh, I will uh, focus on uh, lyrics. Um, so I. We'll share the PowerPoint. I hope I will. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you can see the PowerPoint, yes? Uh, so this is the... Uh, well, I the 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 lyrics. Let's uh, let's say the canonized lyrics uh, of uh, uh, Bella Ciao, uh, in, translated into English. As I said earlier, um, uh, the lyrics uh, offer a, a a structure. Uh, in the first part, you have uh, mm, the. Mm, the, the lyrics set the position between an eye and the embedder. Uh, and it's uh, important to see how the embedder is uh, uh, unspecified. It's uh, a very general, uh, a very general narrative role, narrative position that, as I said earlier, is uh, differently uh, realized, differently uh, actualized uh, according to the context. Uh, and decide that uh, in the uh, original song becomes a partisan. So uh, in the, the second and the third strophe, uh, which are about uh, um, the struggle and uh, also the sacrifice. So the song say, if I die as a partisan, uh, which uh, 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 narrates uh, the uh, the sacrifice for a cause, and the last part of the song, the last three uh, strophes that uh, um, uh, narrate uh, um, the future. So actually, the uh, narrative, the temporal structure of the song is uh, the first part we have a past tense narration. In the second part, we have present tense and the last part we have a future the use of the future uh, so um, uh, we have a clear uh, structure in the song um, we are we have uh, um, a protagonist an eye an antagonist the invader and the struggle for a cause 
which is freedom. So this is the structure, what we call the attention structure of the, uh, of the lyrics with the different narrative roles of the narration. And we have an, a narrative schema. So first of all, there is a disruption. One morning I woke up and I found out that there was an invasion. There is the struggle, there is the sacrifice, and there is uh, actually a, a victory, uh, but a victory with a sacrifice. And uh, the, in the last part, we have uh, this uh, projection towards the future in which the partisan is remembered by, uh, by the community and it, it is remembered for, uh, uh, for, uh, well, for his or her sacrifice for freedom, for our freedom. So this is uh, uh, the narrative schema. And we have, as I said, a, a, sorry, a temporality. Um, we have a temporality, uh, the past of the disruption, the present of the, the struggle, and the future of the liberation. Um, how this structure is differently uh, uh, used in, uh, in different uh, uh, adaptation of the lyrics, what uh, uh, Mari, uh, Marit uh, uh, told me is called the contrafactum. Uh, which I, I ignored uh, before meeting Mari, Marit. Uh, and this is uh, 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 one of the first uh, reuse, reuses of the, of the song, uh, which is the Bella Ciao uh, for the Mondine uh, movement. Uh, Mondine were uh, uh, seasonal rice paddy workers um, of, um, that uh, uh, in the Po Valley, in the north of, of Italy. And uh, uh, well, they, they used to work in, uh, in, in very uh, harsh uh, conditions and they organized uh, uh, strikes uh, and uh, uh, social movements for, the, for their rights. And one of the first uh, um, reused, the, the first readaptation of the song is uh, this uh, Bella Ciao for, uh, uh, for the Mondine, uh, in which you have the same structure, but differently uh, implemented, different uh, uh, contextually uh, realized. So the protagonist is the Mondina, the antagonist obviously is the boss with this cane, which is represented here and the cause is all, obviously uh, to work in freedom. And we have this, the, the same narrative schema. Uh, so the disruption at the beginning, the struggle, uh, and this, uh, the sacrifice that in this case is uh, uh, we lose our youth and uh, at the end, the uh, victory. So, uh, we, we will work in freedom. So we have uh, uh, the same, uh, uh, what uh, in narratology we can define deep structure, but uh, differently realized uh, in the lyrics, changing the lyrics or, um, or the lyrics, as Marit said, uh, uh, with uh, a reference to Dario Martinelli, um, uh, with uh, a connection with the context. So is the context that uh, resignifies the, uh, re the, uh, the, the lyrics. And again, we have the past of the disruption, the present of the structure and the future of the liberation. The same we can say with uh, the Cuban revolution in which uh, uh, again, uh, the protagonist uh, is the guerrillero, the invader is not uh, specified, but in the context, in the historical context is the dictatorship. And obviously again, the cause is freedom. Again, we have the same uh, narrative schema. So we have uh, a, a past, uh, a present and the future, uh, a, with uh, obviously uh, variations uh, in the adaptation of the lyrics, and we have the same temporal structure. So 
Bella Ciao becomes a model that is differently adapted and uh, um, used in the different uh, context, uh, being re continuously resignified by different movements. So this is what uh, happens. Uh, we have uh, the original song and we have the data collection if you, we want to go back to props uh, uh, model we have uh, uh, the um, these uh, three uh, structure in the in the lyrics these three uh, forms in the lyrics that are resignified and adapted through different uses in different contexts um, so uh, we have the Mondina, the Cuban Revolution, the Global Justice Movements, the Arab Springs, the Occupy Wall Street, etc. So the music and the lyrics become a form for organizing and producing new meanings in different contexts. And uh, let's uh, uh, well introduce the uh, transmedia aspect. Uh, because La Casa uh, de Papel, this TV series, is behind the recent revival of the song. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm going to explain uh, why. Mm, the, uh, this, the story uh, is the story of uh, a gang that in Spain attacks uh, two, um, uh, two symbols of the economic system the Bank of Spain, the Royal Mint of Spain. Uh, and the uh, boss, I would say, the leader of the, uh, of the gang, uh, uh, the professor, uses Bella Ciao for motivating the, the group. Uh, and uh, he learned this song from the, his father that fought uh, fascism in Italy, against fascism in Italy uh, during the war. And what the song uh, does in the uh, in the in the TV series resignify the story uh, because the song is uh, um, well since the song is uh, uh, the story of a resistance uh, against a system that uh, oppressed the protagonist the song resignify the story as uh, uh, um, the, the story of the gangs uh, of the of the of Easts that are, are acts of resistance and protest against the, the economic and political system. Uh, actually, uh, La Casa de Papel um, a little bit draws on uh, uh, the historical experience of the recent uh, uh, Spanish crisis and protests. And uh, uh, after this, uh, uh, this TV series, Bella Ciao, the song, and the Dalí Mask spread in movements worldwide uh, uh, since uh, 2017 and are adopted and adapted by demonstrators in protests. So just to give you some example, this is uh, in 2008, uh, there is a sort of uh, the production of um, of a series of song, uh, this is uh, uh, Macri Chao Chao Chao. Macri was the former Argentinian president. Today in Colombia, there is another uh, version that is uh, Duque Chao Chao Chao. Uh, one of um, one of you sent me an Ukrainian case uh, uh, in this uh, in this line. This is the case of Macron with the yellow vest. Actually, this is interesting because actually Bella Ciao can be also appropriated by movements that we uh, maybe we cannot consider as left-wing movements, but also uh, non-left-wing movements. Uh, it's dif well, it's difficult to, to say what uh, the yellow vest uh, uh, were. Uh, until last year, more or less. Obviously, Chile and uh, uh, Ma uh, Marito uh, already mentioned this, Piñera Chao. And more recently, uh, in India, uh, the farmers' protest uh, used Bella Chao in, for protesting and the student movements. So the uh, 
Bella Ciao traveled across the world in the last three years uh, after, uh, after the TV series. I will close with uh, a, a last example, uh, which is uh, uh, the example of uh, Poland and Argentina with the legalization of abortion. Uh, in uh, in Argentina, the, in uh, Poland, the uh, the song was uh, adapted again again with uh, uh, almost philologically because with uh, the same uh, with um, using uh, the same form. So uh, we have in the first part uh, uh, the the past one Thursday the Polish tribunal wanted to take over my body. And the use of this word in, in Polish, ciao, uh, that is very similar to uh, ciao in Italian. Ciao means uh, body in, uh, in, in Polish. And, uh, uh, and there is again a disruption, a struggle, a sacrifice that in this case is uh, the reference to victims and, uh, a, a, um, and the victims and victory, let tomorrow bring the news, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then we have the same structures, but differently uh, realized. And, uh, and we have here the case of uh, um, Argentina. This is a more radical adaptation uh, with, uh, uh, but actually with the same, uh, uh, the same elements, uh, let's say. Um, uh, with uh, a reference again to sacrifice, there are uh, the witches that in the past were burnt, uh, the contraposition between a protagonist and an antagonist. Uh, and in what is interesting in this version of uh, the Argentinian Bella Ciao is, uh, um, is the fact that uh, in the song is uh, constructed a sort of long memory. Uh, so a struggle again against uh, capitalism and patriarchy uh, in which uh, the, uh, the struggle for the legalization of abortion is, let's say, an episode. So uh, this is a very uh, radical readaptation of the song. Uh, what is, uh, um, well, what is interesting here is that, uh, uh, like in the case of prop with the folk tale, um, the structure can be uh, managed and remanaged. So it is not, uh, uh, I mean, it is not uh, um, set in stone, but uh, activists remanage continuously the different elements that are uh, in the song, readapting to uh, the song to their cause and to, to their needs. Uh, so uh, I, um, I finished. Uh, here my analysis. Uh, so just to uh, summarize the, this, uh, this trajectory, uh, uh, the idea was to, um, to see how we analyzed uh, the case of Bella Ciao, uh, trying to combine form and movement in our analysis in trying to build this uh, common ground of comparison that allowed us to, um, to compare different cases uh, with uh, different languages, uh, different, uh, uh, also different media, like in the case of, uh, 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 of La Casa de Papel, and uh, uh, different uh, uh, cultures, contexts, causes, uh, and struggles. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, what we wanted to share with you. And um, uh, actually, we can start with a discussion, if you, if you like, if you, 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 you have questions or uh, or other um, or comments on that. Thank you.